PragerU is a YouTube channel that uploads short lectures in an attempt to educate its audience on a variety of topics like economics, politics, and sometimes science. Well, I found a video where they covered evolution as a topic, and believe it or not, they tried to debunk it. They tried. It didn't go well for them. Let's see what they have to say. Evolution. You learned about it in high school. Yep, studied it in high school, then again in college, and then in graduate school, my research projects use the principles of evolutionary theory all the time. It goes like this. Life started out with very simple forms, and then gradually, over hundreds of millions of years, morphed into all the forms we see today. Bacteria to Beethoven. Not a straight line, of course, but that's roughly how it went. This was the theory proposed by Charles Darwin in 1859, and with some modification, it's been embraced as unassailable by the scientific community over the last century. I'd say there were more than some changes. Since Darwin, we have learned so much about evolutionary theory, things that Darwin couldn't even imagine. Yet despite all that we've learned and all the changes that have been made, the core of Darwin's original theory of evolution is still true and is supported by a mountain of evidence. As evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins says, if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is either ignorant, stupid, or insane. But is that right? Are there no scientific reasons to doubt the evolutionary account of life's origins? In November 2016, I attended a conference in London convened by some of the world's leading evolutionary biologists. The purpose? To address growing doubts about the modern version of Darwin's theory. Um, okay, so what was the conference, who was there, and what did they say? You conveniently leave that information out. But don't worry, I went searching and I think I found what he was talking about. So it turns out that in 2016 in London, the Royal Society held a conference entitled New Trends in Evolutionary Biology, Biological, Philosophical, and Social Science Perspectives. Now, I've read through some of the abstracts of the talks there, and from what I can gather, it's just a conference where people gather to talk about additions or changes to the evolutionary theory. Nobody there was doubting it or talking about upending the theory entirely. Hmm, I think that might be why he didn't want to tell us the name of the conference. Let's look at just two scientific reasons to doubt this theory. First, the Cambrian explosion. A weird and wonderful thing happened 530 million years ago. A whole bunch of major groups of animals, what scientists call the phyla, appeared abruptly within a geologically short window of time, about 10 million years. These novel animal forms, exhibiting prototypes of most animal body designs we see today, emerged in the fossil record without evidence of earlier ancestors. Did you catch that? A huge number of diverse animals appeared with no discernible antecedents. So where did they come from? This question really bothered Darwin, and he acknowledged that he could give it no satisfactory answer. Yeah, and like a good scientist, Darwin acknowledged that that is a problem or a challenge to his theory. But now modern scientists have been able to kind of fill in the gaps for him. Nor can scientists today. Uh, this is awkward. The renowned biologist Eugene Koonin of the National Center for Biotechnology Information describes the abrupt appearance of the Cambrian animals and other organisms such as dinosaurs, birds, flowering plants, and mammals as a pattern of biological big bangs. So what caused all these new forms of life to arise? Okay, let's start with the huge thing that you conveniently left out. The Cambrian explosion is not the first evidence of life that we have on Earth, as you're kind of making it out to seem. You see, the oldest evidence of single-celled life on Earth is thought to be around 4 billion years old. The Cambrian explosion, on the other hand, didn't happen until about 541 million years ago. That's a 3.5 billion year gap for single-celled life to evolve from single cells to eukaryotes all the way up to multicellular organisms, and even mollusks show up in the evolutionary timeline before the Cambrian explosion happened. They didn't just pop out of nowhere. And so what if Eugene Koonin describes it as a biological Big Bang? It's just a figure of speech. If you actually went and read any of his recent papers, you would see that he does not support this idea that evolution is wrong at all. That question leads to a second big doubt, the DNA enigma. In the 1950s, James Watson and Francis Crick made a startling discovery. 
The DNA molecule stores information as a four-character digital code. Strings of precisely sequenced chemicals inside the DNA helix store the instructions, the information, for building the crucial proteins that cells need to survive. Unless the chemical letters in the DNA text are sequenced properly, a protein molecule will not form. Well, no, most genes are not as fragile as you're making it out to be. Just go to any graduate student in any biology lab working anywhere in the country right now and ask them how many times they mutated their protein, only for their mutation to do absolutely nothing to the protein. Maybe if you paid more attention when learning about evolution in high school, you would remember that mutations can be neutral, good, or bad. But most of the time, they're neutral, meaning they don't affect the gene or the protein at all. No proteins, no cells. No cells, no living organisms. Bill Gates has said DNA is like a software program. Let's think about that for a second. For computers to run faster and perform more functions, they require new code. Well, the same is true for life. To build new forms of life, the evolutionary process would need to produce new genetic information, new code. Yep, and how cells do that with their DNA is actually quite fascinating, and we've learned a lot about it in just the past 10 years. This is one of those things that Darwin really couldn't have imagined. And a lot of what we've learned is summarized really nicely in this review article which summarizes and discusses the findings of over a hundred other scientific papers. We're not going to go into exactly what is said because it's really long and you can read it for yourselves. I'll put the link in the description, but just know that scientists understand how new genes evolve and form. Unfortunately, our friend Stephen here probably hasn't read this paper or anything like it, and so he just goes on and on for a little bit about things that he doesn't understand, claiming that scientists don't understand it either, when in reality we have a pretty good handle on it. So we'll just let him talk for a little bit. But this raises questions about the creative power of natural selection and mutation. Natural selection is a simple sorting process. Species keep favorable mutations that allow them to survive, but eliminate bad mutations that cause their members to die out. No one doubts that natural selection is a real process and that it produces minor variations. But many biologists now doubt that it produces major innovations in biological form. Notice again how he doesn't name a single biologist after he says that many biologists doubt this. To see why, think again about software. What happens if you introduce a few random changes into computer code? You'll likely mess it up, right? Though it might still work if you don't make too many changes. But if you make enough random changes, your program will stop functioning altogether. You certainly can't keep doing this and expect some cool new program to pop out. Uh, oh, Stephen, you've been talking about it this whole time, and now you forget it at the most important moment during your terrible analogy. Natural selection. If you include natural selection in your analogy, then each random change to the code will be tested against natural selection in order to determine whether it's good, bad, or a neutral change. This is exactly what biologists do with directed evolution, which is what Francis Arnold won a Nobel Prize for. Directed evolution is a process that usually starts with scientists picking one particular gene. From there, they're able to make billions of copies of that one gene. Then they're able to take all of those copies and subject them to random mutations. Finally, they can take all of these mutated genes and see how they perform in a test. The ones that perform well are then taken for another round of random mutation and another round of testing. This can be repeated over and over again, all with random mutations with natural selection, in order to create a more desired enzyme, a more desired protein, a more desired gene, what, what have you. So directed evolution shows us that with random mutation and natural selection, evolution can eventually give rise to better, or just new genes. Unfortunately, our friend Stephen doesn't seem to be aware of this pioneering work done by Frances Arnold, who, by the way, is amazing. I will link to one of her videos where she explains directed evolution in the description. You should check it out. She's awesome. There's a mathematical reason for this. In all codes and languages, there are vastly more ways of arranging characters that will generate gibberish than there are arrangements that will generate meaningful sequences. And this applies to DNA. 
Remember, natural selection only selects sequences that random mutations generate. Oh, he's remembered natural selection again. How convenient that he's done with his really bad analogy. Yet experiments have established that DNA sequences capable of making stable proteins are extremely rare, and thus really hard to stumble on randomly. How rare? While working at Cambridge University, molecular biologist Douglas Ack showed that for every DNA sequence that generates a relatively short functional protein, there are 10 to the 77th power non-functional sequences. Yeah, that's not true. Douglas Ax actually did this calculation using a protein that is inherently unstable. So any mutations that he made made the protein fall apart, and then he got this ridiculously large number. Like I said earlier, many, many, many proteins you can mutate all over the place and not get any apparent loss of function. Now consider that there are only 10 to the 65th power atoms in our galaxy. So finding a new DNA sequence capable of building a functional protein is like searching blindfolded for a single marked atom among a trillion Milky Way galaxies. Talk about a needle in a haystack. As I show in my book, Darwin's Doubt, even four billion years of life's history is not enough time to overcome a search problem this big. Except it is because that number is hugely inflated. And just in case you forgot again, natural selection. Scientists who know about these problems are not ignorant, stupid, or insane. They are just appropriately skeptical. Most scientists don't consider these to be problems because they actually understand what we've been able to learn after hundreds of years of study and the contributions of thousands of scientists from all over the world. Well, that's all Stephen has for us today. I really wish that these people who question science actually took the time to read a little bit more about science before they question it. Well, that's going to do it for this video. This has been Debunk the Funk. I'm Dr. Wilson. And join me next week where we'll be watching the battle of vitamins versus vaccines. See you then.